Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by OldSchoolShirts.com. Hey, check them out. You like defunct teams and leagues and T-shirt form? Well, you'll find them there, but a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Do you remember a radio station of the past or perhaps a mall that you used to go to? All kinds of great cultural and sports memories can be found at the great folks at OldSchoolShirts.com. Promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. And now, here's our show. Reunion Arena in Dallas, where the lights are out for the introduction of the starting lineups. The fireworks are just beginning. It should be a whole afternoon of fireworks. The first weekend of the AFL on NBC, the Dallas Desperados hosting the New York Dragons here at Reunion Arena. Tom Hammond and Pat Hayden ready for this opening weekend of the AFL on NBC. And Pat looking forward to a whole season of a pass-happy, high-scoring football. You know, if you grew up watching football and you thought, oh, you know, defense wins championships and you you need balance between the run and the pass. This is an entirely different brand of football. Very quarterback driven. And there's two things I think that really strike me about this game, Tom. In the kickoff games, and there's 8 to 10 kickoffs a game, it is absolutely a scoring opportunity on a kickoff return. And secondly, no score is safe. No lead is safe because you could score so quickly in this game. And of course, it's a 50-yard field and the nets on either end are in play, which makes so far some bizarre scoring opportunities sometimes. And uh, eight players aside, and they play most of them both ways. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Oh my goodness. How are you, everybody? It's your pal, Tim Hanlon, and uh, welcome back to the box office. It's Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. We appreciate you finding us. Thanks for coming on by. And um, while I'm sure this week's guest uh, may not have put that clip and those three or four years at NBC Sports high on his resume, that was, of course, the Arena Football League as presented on NBC. Uh, But our guest this week, Tom Hammond, uh, not only did that, but lots of other stuff at NBC Sports primarily and a bunch of other little uh, interesting little tidbits of uh, of sportsdom as uh, as we go through our conversation this week. Uh, he's got a great new memoir out. It's called Races, Games, and Olympic Dreams, A Sportscaster's Life. And uh, a, a more delightful gentleman you will not find, and a more wide and varied uh, set of sports covered uh, at NBC Sports. What a, a dream career, frankly. And we get into uh, lots of different places, including the aforementioned Arena Football League. Let's get that out of the way, shall we? Um, you may remember back in uh, 2003 through 2006, the uh, uh, the Amer- Arena Football League and NBC struck this uh, at the time re- relatively unique deal uh, to um, uh, essentially uh, uh, take up, I guess, the gap that NBC was uh, missing since they had lost the uh, American Football Conference package uh, from the NFL in uh, 1998 and all kinds of experimental stuff, including, as you may remember, the XFL in 2001. Luckily for Tom, for Tom's sake and for others, uh, he was not part of that a debacle uh, a set of broadcasts. But the Arena Football League was intriguing, and NBC went really gung-ho into uh, wall-to-wall coverage. They had regional telecasts and Al Troutwig and others uh, in a big studio show and, and all that kind of stuff. And Tom Hammond, along with Pat Hayden, uh, were uh, the uh, number one team uh, for that package. And they, uh, of course, were also at the time uh, the um, presenting team for Notre Dame football, which uh, NBC had fairly recently uh, acquired as well. Uh, Lewis Johnson on the sideline for both of those sets of broadcasts. However, the uh, the legend that is Tom Hammond is uh, well known beyond the AFL, I think, frankly, uh, for many, many more things besides that. But of, of course, our want here is on this show is to remember the stuff that's been forgotten. But uh, we could not do the uh, the uh, career uh, of Tom Hammond, especially at NBC Sports, uh, any justice without uh, a, a, a lengthy discussion about uh, the various places 
uh, that he uh, called uh, many some legendary calls in thoroughbred racing in particular, of course. And we'll talk in our conversation, we'll hear in our conversation with uh, with Tom in a few moments. Um, that's kind of the impetus that uh, got him into uh, the spotlight at NBC was his knowledge of and ability to call and uh, diagnose, dissect, and uh, and add a lot of color to thoroughbred racing, the uh, Breeders' Cup, uh, the Triple Crown, NBC obviously getting involved heavily in that, but also NFL football and uh, Notre Dame football, uh, the NBA on NBC, which is coming back next year with uh, Bill Walton and Steve Snapper Jones. Uh, Tom Hammond was uh, often paired. Uh, his uh, collegiality with uh, Dick Enberg and and doing all kinds of other uh, stuff, but but probably maybe most notably to the average sports fan, although. I think those are probably uh, you could probably uh, interview somebody on the street and say, hey, what what uh, things do you remember Tom Hammond calling? It was certainly also uh, perhaps underlined by his uh, many Olympics coverages, Olympics year, Olympic games coverages. Yeah, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say, uh, both outdoor in the um, track and field competition, uh, as well as gymnastics uh, during the summer games, as well as figure skating for a number of different Olympics uh, in, during the winter versions of such. We'll have a couple of calls from that and uh, ask him what some of his more memorable calls were for those and and other things. So a wonderful conversation heading your way in a moment's time uh, with the great legendary voice of NBC Sports, Tom Hammond. And again, his new memoir is called Races, Games, and Olympic Dreams, A Sportscaster's Life. Uh, you can find it wherever good books are found. It is published by our friends at the uh, University of Press University Press of Kentucky, please. Let's get that uh, title correct. And of course, you can buy a copy uh, through our link conveniently on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Just search up this episode with Tom Hammond numbered 365, my goodness. And uh, you'll find a, a couple of convenient links. We'll get a couple of referral shekels of love from Amazon. And we appreciate if you buy it that way uh, for sure. All right, let's waste no more time. Let us uh, segue nice and smoothly into our wonderful conversation with the great Tom Hammond. We had it a couple of weeks back. Uh, please, as always, enjoy. I would love uh, for our audience, especially of a certain generation, um, maybe a little bit of background as to how you got even started in this broadcasting business, because... A guy from Kentucky, right, who's majoring in various forms of agricultural sciences. Um, I think that's what the major was or folk around it. Um, doesn't seem like a likely person to become, frankly, a legendary sports broadcaster. Well, it surprised me too, Tim. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I never had any intention or aspirations of being a broadcaster. Never even crossed my mind, to be honest. Uh, I thought I was going to go into the thoroughbred horse business. Majored in animal science and worked to, as a groom at the racetrack in New York in the summer times. And uh, when I graduated from college, I couldn't find a very good job. So out of desperation, I uh, sort of went to graduate school. And while I was there, I began working with pedigrees with a, with a friend of mine named Tom Gentry. who had a horse farm here in the central Kentucky area. And uh, one evening, he uh, had a party, invited me. One of his other friends was there named Dave Hooper, who worked for the Daily Racing Forum but also had a nightly horse race results show on the radio. Now, this is for the information age, before you get information at the click of a mouse, and someone in Kentucky might have bred a horse running in New York or some other place around the country, would have to wait till the next day to find out how that horse did, unless they listened to this radio show. So we had this radio show at WVLK Radio and was being transferred by his primary uh, uh, employer, the uh, racing forum to Miami, and he couldn't find anyone to take his place. So he said, you know, uh, would you be interested in that? And I said, well, I bet I could do that. Uh, not having any idea that I could, but I needed a job of some kind. So he said, all right, we'll see you down there tomorrow. And that was how I began broadcasting, reading the race results, horse race results on the radio uh, for $35 a week. And uh, once I had my foot in the door, then I also began to do a nightly sports show and began to do some high school games on the radio. Uh, then we did uh, news, became the news director, became the program director, and uh, from that moved on to local television, uh, WLEX-TV in Lexington, where the first thing I ever did on television, Tim, was a, a game, a basketball game between Kentucky and Kansas. 
you can imagine that. Uh, a game that a lot of broadcasters would give anything to do. And here I was in my first event on television doing that, that basketball game. But that's how I got started, all, almost by accident, uh, with no prior training, no communications courses, nothing of that nature, never any, even any dream that I would be a broadcaster, and uh, thrust right into it by doing the race results on the radio. All right. Well, so let, let's back up for a second, because I, either you're a, a born natural or how did you will yourself into that? I mean, did you did you have any fear whatsoever as you were broadcasting? Did you, did you recognize that you're, you know, on the air, people were listening to you? Did you not know what you didn't know? I mean, like, how, how do you ascribe that um, uh, relatively straightforward uh, uh, approach and and uh, more and more assignments and stuff because it, p- people get degrees to get that those kinds of starts. Yeah, you know, I uh, I'm sure I was nervous to start. And I'm sure I was probably pretty awful, but uh, I was able to learn my way. And I think one of the things that throughout my career that I've been able to do is to learn how to learn. I know what it takes to make me learn something new, and I've not been afraid to try new things. Uh, throughout my my NBC career, that was the case too, as I took on track and field or figure skating, something I knew nothing about previously. So, um, yeah, once uh, that foot was in the door, I found out that uh, I enjoyed it. I, I seem to have a knack for doing it, uh, as, as, you know, who would have expected, but but uh, I seemed to catch on to it pretty well. And uh, by the time I, I spent a couple of years doing it and moved on to television, I was uh, I had aspirations of even making it to the, to the network of all things, which uh, in those days, Tim was a little different because there was no ESPN, there was no, there's not even that Fox. There were three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS. And uh, to make it to the network level to do sports, never having worked in a market bigger than Lexington, Kentucky, was a long shot at best. But like you uh, say, I, I got my foot in the door and I got uh, over those nervousness and got some confidence and uh, had aspirations of making it to the quote big time. Uh, if I could, and uh, it just seemed to all work out, and things just sort of fell into my into place, it fell into my lap during these these years of of learning to be a broadcaster. So your your dues were paid largely at the local television, local radio, and local television level. I'm assuming the station you were at was an NBC affiliate at the time. NBC affiliate, and uh, you know, it was uh, compared to nowadays, it was primitive, very very primitive. And uh, I was a one-man sports department, and uh, so I would uh, go out to the high school events or the co- or the UK college events, University of Kentucky events, and I would shoot 16 millimeter film. I would take the film back to the station and process it. Uh, I, I would edit it. Uh, I would write the script. I would uh, post the scores, which was then on a magnetic board. This was before the the uh, Chirons, before the character generators that they use now. Uh, and then I would go out and uh, read the script at 11 o'clock. I even did the weather as well as the news. So um, uh, it was it was primitive, but it was uh, beneficial because I learned the business from the ground up. And uh, Harry Barfield, who was the general manager at WLAX TV, did me a couple of great favors. The first being to let me find my way to learn my job without having to uh, look over my shoulder all the time and and criticize me or, or put pressure on me. And the other thing he let me do was to start working at the uh, prestigious Keeneland sales, the sales of thoroughbred horses at Keeneland, which are the world's best. And uh, I was able that way to supplement my income, and I didn't have to do the normal television routine of trying to seek a bigger market all the time, to move to a bigger market. So I was able to do what I wanted, stay in Lexington, and yet uh, have enough money that I didn't have to look for a better job somewhere else. And, and what did that involve? Was that kind of like doing the the, ho- the hollering and the hooting, to, essentially to get uh, the bidding up and stuff, and a, a, not no. like an auction kind of guy? No. How it works is they bring the horse into the auction ring. You're in a, a little arena where it sit, people are sitting around, and then the, you, uh, you, I would read the pedigree, announce the pedigree of the horse, and give any updates on what any of his half brothers or full brothers have done since the catalog was printed, and point out the highlights of the catalog. It would take about 30, 40 seconds for me to do that. And then the auctioneer would take over and actually do the, the selling, the bidding of the on the horse. And, you know, with those, at those sales at Keeneland, we sold millions and millions of dollars worth, worth of horses. And so I guess if you added it all up in the billions over the years. And uh, so, so it was a very prestigious uh, spot to start out there at Keeneland, the best in the world. 
But once I started doing that, I also got offers to start doing uh, uh, horse auctions in other places like uh, Ocala, Florida. And at one time I was in about 10 states, I think, doing auctions like that. So uh, I was able to uh, open that as a sidelight and still keep doing my television job at least for 10 years, at which time I decided that it was time to, to move on to something else. Well, so ironically, you were actually in the horse racing or the thoroughbred business, so to speak, which is what your original intent was back in college. Exactly. And that's my background in that, uh, which I had planned on having all along, was what then came to my aid to help me get those jobs and also help me to, uh, uh, to become a, quote, horse racing expert so that when NBC had the first uh, uh, Breeders' Cup, they needed a horse racing experts because they'd never done racing on television before and uh, Dick Enberg, who, whom I had met, uh, recommended me, and NBC hired me. And I have to go back and and uh, and give the, I guess, the full story on that. As you said earlier, I was working at an NBC affiliate, and when they would come to town to do uh, a Kentucky basketball game, Dick Enberg, Billy Packer, and Al McGuire, the great threesome, uh, I would go down the day before and try to tell them uh, what I knew about this Kentucky team, and uh, uh, try to help them you know, do the broadcast. And so uh, I got to know them a little bit. And one day when they came in, uh, Dick Enberg says to me, my, my plane doesn't leave until about five hours after the game. Is there any way you can take me to see Secretariat? And I said, well, sure. So I arranged for us to, to visit Secretariat. We drove over to Paris, Kentucky, to Claiborne Farm. And the man who run it, ran it, uh, Seth Hancock, joined us. We stood by the fence in the secretariat's paddock, and he ran over to, to meet us, to see us. And uh, Dick says to me, he says, "What? Uh, how do you know if a horse is going to be great? And I said, well, you really don't. It's, uh, it's all kind of guesswork. But you look at their pedigree. You see what all their ancestors have done. You look at the confirmation, the way they're all put together. Are they athletic? Do you think they'll be able to be a, an athletic sort of horse to perform at, at the highest levels? Uh, and that's, you know, that after that, good luck. And uh, Seth Hancock says, and sometimes you can just see it in their eyes. And when he said that, Secretary had jerked his head around and looked Dick Enberg right in the eye. And the Dick never forgot that moment. He talked about it many times afterwards. And that was the beginning of a, of a great friendship between me and Dick Enberg. And um, the, uh, not, not only a, a friendship, but uh, he became my mentor. And uh, I observed a lot, not only by talking to him, but by observing him in action. And uh, and he would played a big part in, in my career. All right. So, t- so tell me then actually how this, y- your setup in the booth with the legendary Dick Enberg happens. And this is in 1984. You mentioned it before that the that NBC is the first time they were getting into horse racing. They weren't doing any of the Triple Crown stuff at that time yet. This is the Breeders' Cup, which, are, which is a relatively new, if not spank, brand spanking new, uh, uh, a, a, a augmentation, I guess, of the that the the three crown jewels of of the triple crown. Um, maybe a little background of the Breeders' Cup, and maybe a little bit more play by play about how you how this actually happens. Because, with all due respect, it feels like a big jump, pretty quickly. I guess it was Tim, and uh, so it, it's it's a bit of a long story, but. Uh, the Breeders' Cup is like it's the year-end championship event for horse racing. It's not part of the Triple Crown. It's the year-end event. It's the uh, the World Series, the Super Bowl, whatever, in several different categories of horses. In other words, you have the Classic, which is the ultimate race, which is four and a half million dollar race, and you have uh, the Distaff for the fillies and mares, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, NBC, never having done horse racing before, was panicked and they hired a bunch of people to be uh, announcers. And I was probably at uh, the bottom of the totem pole. I was uh, to roam through the barn area, through the stable area, and do reports from back there. But uh, some things just broke my way. I mean, just unbelievable events happened that uh, that were in my favor. But one of them was, and again, I told you this is kind of involved, but the Breeders' Cup Classic, the ultimate event of the day, was uh, was the $4 million race, probably to decide a horse of the year. And there were three primary contenders, uh, Slew of Gold, Gate Dancer, and Wild Again. Well, Wild Again was a horse that was uh, really not thought of to be a contender. And because he had not been originally nominated, they had to put up $300,000 in order to enable him to run. And I said to the producer, John Gonzalez, I'd like to do a story on this horse, Wild Again, because they're 
paying all this money for a horse that's 35 to 1 in the, in the odds and no one thinks has a chance to win. And Pete Axtelm, who was on the crew then, said, uh, no, no, we cannot do that. We'll look stupid because this horse is vermin. <laughs> so I said, well, kind of that's the point. I want to say to them, why are you doing this? Why are you spending all this money for a horse that has no chance? So we set up this interview with uh, the horse wild again in the stall behind us as I spoke with the, the owner, Bill Allen, the horse is between us. And I said, uh, Bill, why in the world would you put up $300,000 for a horse to run that has no chance of winning? And he says, well, not only do we think he has a good chance of winning, we're betting our money. And between us, uh, Wild again starts nodding his head up and down. <laughs> and, and it made for a nice uh, nice shot. I'm told that several NBC executives made trips to the betting window on <laughs> based on that on that story. And then the thing that really uh, that came across was Don Henry was a great gelding who once sold for $1,000 at the sales and wound up earning uh, over $6 million and uh, was... Uh, a chance he was injured and unable to run in that first Breeders' Cup Classic, and uh, he still had a chance to be Horse of the Year, depending on what happened in the outcome of the Classic. And so I thought it would be funny if I put a TV up in front of his stall and said that he's going to be watching because he could, you know, be Horse of the Year depending on what happened. And just about uh, 30 seconds before I was to go on the air, someone unknown to me delivered a dozen red roses to John Henry, and I said, "Here, here, hand me those roses." And as I held the roses, John Henry reached out of his stall and began to munch on them. And it made such a cute shot that the, they ran it several times during the course of the broadcast. When the uh, my duties were supposed to be over, Tim, as the, as the big race approached, so I went from the stable area back in front just to watch the race. And I'm standing there right by the finish line. And as they come down the stretch, I mean, all hell breaks loose. There's bumping every which way. And so the inquiry sign goes up. And now the stewards want to talk to each of the jockeys just so they uh, can figure out their version of events. And what happened is they look at the at the recordings to figure out who is at fault and if there will be a disqualification. Uh, Pat Day was on Wild again. He was a jockey that uh, was uh, well known throughout Kentucky, and I had known him, of course, from being here. And uh, I was not supposed to be on the air anymore, but when Pat Day got off the phone after talking to the stewards, he saw me standing there and just came over to me to be interviewed. Uh, and so uh, I told the producers, I've got Pat Day. And uh, he was on the horse wild again that had crossed the line first, but now was in risk of being disqualified. So I got uh, his version of events. Uh, the race was over, made official. Uh, wild again was indeed the winner, the long shot that we had discussed earlier, and uh, it, it made for a great story. When the day was over, Michael Weissman, who was then the uh, executive producer at NBC Sports, said uh, we didn't realize until all this week that we had a broadcaster on our hand. Would you be interested in doing other things for NBC Sports, starting with NFL football? And uh, that was the start of 34 years at NBC Sports. So it happened. It happened that quickly. That I mean, the, yeah. your your audition, so to speak, that you didn't even know was an audition, really made an impression. It, it did, and you know, as I said earlier, I'd gotten to know not only uh, Enberg, Packer, and McGuire from those visits to Lexington, but the producers and directors too. So uh, I wasn't a total unknown to them. I'd just never been on the air for them before. And uh, and I think they were you know, you know, glad to see me succeed and and, and uh, thought about me for doing other things as well. I, I never uh, dreamed that it would uh, expand to so many different sports. Uh, when I first started, I was doing horse racing, of course, which weren't many events, and, uh, and then NFL football games. And starting out with NFL football, probably at the bottom of the totem pole on that as well. Who was but your, who was yeah, your first you know, booth? Who was your first uh, uh, booth mates uh, in those, uh, first, those early days that what sixth or seventh string, right? Yeah, whatever it was, it was down at the bottom, whatever it was, or close to the bottom. Um, and in those days at NBC that they rotated the play by play men and analysts and producers and directors as well. Uh, kind of a strange thing, but the Dick Enberg and Merlin Olson, the number one team, always were the same, the same group. But uh, and the rest of us, the sort of alternated or or you know went back and forth different ones. My first game was uh, was uh, at New Orleans when Bum Phillips was still the Saints coach. It was Kansas City at New Orleans, and um, Bob Kuchenberg was my sure. analyst. Uh, the former Dolphins offensive lineman on the Dolphins unbeaten team. And uh, 
he, he only had a short run at NBC, but he was my first partner. And, and Tim, in those days, uh, Marty Glickman, the famous broadcaster, was sort of the NBC announcer coach. And uh, he called me back uh, afterwards and said, I've looked at the tape and uh, fine. Uh, just remember, though, you're on television and you're not on the radio. Cut back the reach by 10 percent. So uh, I passed that first football test. And uh, I tell you a, a funny thing, too, when before I had done my first game, football game, I had to do a practice game. It was in Seattle with Enberg and Olson doing the broadcast on NBC, but we would be, we being uh, myself and uh, and also uh, Sam Bertigliano, who had just been fired as the Cleveland Browns coach and was sure. auditioning the job as, a, as an analyst. So we were to do the game into a machine, into a tape machine, and then have the uh, the uh, executives review it, um, and at a Dinner the night before, Larry Cirillo, who was the number one football producer at NBC, uh, had a dinner and was holding court, telling stories and everything with all these about 20 people sitting around. And the only person there that I knew was Dick Enberg. Uh, but there's telling stories. And Larry Cirillo says, well, NBC is trying to get all these new people involved. He said, last week they sent me an auto racing announcer. And, oh, boy, he was terrible. And uh, he said, but get, get this. Get this. This week, they're sending a horse racing announcer. And uh, I was sitting here at the table. I just sort of slid down in my chair. <laughs> and uh, no one exactly knew who he was talking about except Enberg. And he was at the other end of the table. So there I was. Uh, that was my first event. And, and as it turns out, uh, Rattigliano was lost on television, had no idea. And when they uh, critiqued the tapes, they didn't even look at me. They just looked at him and tried to help him out because he'd already been hired. So uh, that's how I escaped and got to do my my first game i guess how did you how did you how did the how did the adjustment to the nfl go right obviously it's a juggernaut now but still that's that this is a prime you're you're now in the prime sort of sports uh firmament uh at nbc this is one of their their biggest um their biggest uh, uh series of events and stuff um how much football did you have in your background and how much of a learning curve did you have besides toning it down a little to be on tv versus quote-unquote radio no one ever asked if I had done football on television, so I didn't volunteer that I never had. That helps. And, <laughs> but I, I'd done a few games on the radio. I played football, uh, so uh, you know, I was not uh, not a total stranger to the game. Uh, and fear is a great motivator, Tim. So you know, in order to get ready for the game, I watched a lot of tapes and listened to a lot of broadcasts and and tried to familiarize myself that way. And uh, my own style, I guess, developed. I didn't have any idea what, what it would be like, but I think having grown up in Kentucky and listening to some great broadcasters, Claude Sullivan and Kay Wood Ledford, um, probably planted in my brain, even though I didn't know I'd be a broadcaster, sort of a, a less is more mentality. And I, and I can think that probably became one of my trademarks. I was always less is more and in a big moment uh, to remain silent and, and let the moment play uh, if you're on television. And uh, that was it. But it, there was a learning curve for sure. And, and again, I don't know how good I was to start with, but Marty Glickman really encouraged me. Uh, he was really complimentary that first year. And uh, in fact, Michael Weissman said, I'm going to give you this bowl assignment uh, to do sideline actually on the bowl. Well, I was supposed to do play by play. And then uh, again, a story. But um, hey, this is a podcast. We love stories. Go for it. Is this the yeah. Orange Bowl by per chance or Fiesta? It was the, the Citrus Bowl, actually. Citrus. And then he said, I want you to do the play-by-play -play because you've done so well in your first season. And, uh, you know, you've risen through the ranks. And uh, and we're going to reward you by giving you this job. And uh, one of the other announcers who'd been there for, like, you know, 10 or 15 years raised a ruckus that, uh, how can you give him that job? It should go to me. And so uh, they explained that to me and said, do the sideline report for us. Take your whole family to Orlando for a week on NBC, and that's our thank you to you for the for the job you've done. So th w that was your first sort of um, expansion beyond horse racing and the NFL was a college bowl game. Take us through the next couple of years as to how now you're in the NBC machinery. What other things uh, either are you eyeing or uh, potentially in the mix for, or are you just happy to be there doing, doing the NFL stuff and the horse racing stuff? Happy to be there, Tim, and just concentrate on those two areas in which I was uh, 
working at the moment. Uh, but the big break occurred to me about, I don't know how many years it was in, maybe two or three, four, uh, when I was assigned and then a permanent partner, and that partner was Joe Namath. Um, and so that sort of gave me credibility. And uh, while Joe would be the first to admit he wasn't the world's greatest broadcaster, he was uh, a known name, and he was uh, he was someone that uh, people that couldn't even have been alive when he was at his peak would come and ask him for autographs. And he was a celebrity. He was a famous person, and it gave me credibility. And uh, he couldn't have been a nicer a nicer person. And we became friends, and still are friends. And um, you know that that was kind of a a nice break for me. And I continue that to, to run up the up the ladder. Um, again, I've told you that so many fortunate things happened in my career, and but I wasn't eyeing any other sports except that uh, when uh, NBC finally got the NBA rights, they uh, had their their teams set, except they needed one more. Uh, a third analyst uh, when they had more than uh, two games on a weekend. And so they were trying out different analysts at games with with uh, going into tape machines and critiquing the tapes just like we did before for the football. And so in order to, uh, to give these uh, analysts a tryout, they had me go with them to broadcast a game. I'd done a, a SEC basketball games uh, for a total of 30 years, and this would have been about halfway through that tenure. And uh, so I knew basketball. So they uh, needed someone to just go do a, a game into a tape machine with a prospective analyst. And so I did a bunch of broadcasts with these uh, with these would be analysts. And uh, then they selected actually a couple of them. And they said, "All right, so our our final team. Oh, wait, who's going to do the play by play on that their game?" And somebody said, well, yeah, "Tom's been doing these games. It's worked out great. So let's have Tom do it." So that's how I got into it. NBA play-by-play -play as well, and eventually uh, uh, climbing the ladder on that as well with uh, with Steve uh, Snapper Jones and with Bill Walton. Two legends they, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's how I got to, to be an NBA broadcaster, and we had some some tremendous moments uh, during those days. And it was, as I've told people, uh, you know, Bill Walton was a unique American character, and uh, being with him was, uh, uh, was always the an adventure. Uh, but we had so much fun. We, When we first met uh, the day before the game, we would laugh all the way through the production meeting, all the way through a dinner night before. We'd laugh in the car on the way to the game. We'd laugh during the game, and then we'd laugh on the way to the airport. It was so much fun, and, and we just uh, had a ball doing it. When I when I first was play-by-play -play with Walton and, and Snapper, who had known each other uh, with the Portland Trailblazers, uh, they were they were doing their thing. Walton would say outrageous things, and the snapper would call him on it. And you know, I was sort of playing it straight, doing the play by play. Mm -hmm. And I finally figured out for this to really work, I'm going to have to get in on the fun. I'm going to have to jump on Walton as well. And when I started doing that, it sort of clicked, and uh, we we had lots of laughs, and I think the audience had a lot lots of laughs as well. So um, as again, uh, was something that was uh, just fell into my lap, luckily, and uh, and able to take advantage of it. Now, we're talking right now roughly in the early 1990s. I think the NBA uh, and NBC kind of got together. Well, they had a, a run back in the 50s and early 60s, but I think it was 1990 uh, when that uh, that deal came together. Uh, and ironically, coming back uh, next year as part of the uh, the new NBA package. By the way, quick yeah. parenthetical, how about a reunion of those still around? I think you should go and, uh, and either call or, or at least be part of a game or two, don't you think? That'd be good. I'd be I'd be up for that. Yep. Uh, I don't think NBC thinks so much about the the guys in the past, though. Uh, the uh, they had me do a couple of features for the for the Breeders' Cup, but uh, I haven't done too much for them since. Well, since if they're if they're bringing back John Tesh's round ball rock, they can bring back Marv and you and some of the other greats and Bob <laughs> Costas and all that stuff for because you guys made the NBA that decade and 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 change. Um, I think most people of a certain age would. I think that's why there's so much, um, at least in the industry, so much, um, I don't know, uh, a, 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 an aura around this, uh, the, the notion that NBC is going to have the NBA back and not just not just the theme song. Yeah, well, uh, you know, NBC did a great job on it with uh, you know, great production staff and wonderful announcers and, and not, not including myself. You know, I was just happy to be part of part of the deal. But basketball has always come naturally for me. And uh, once I figured out the the formula for interacting with with Snapper and Walton, it was a 
it was fun and hopefully fun for the audience as well. I do, do have to say that one time during uh, the playoffs, uh, Dick Ebersall, the chairman of NBC Sports, called uh, our production truck. Kevin Smolin was the producer and mm-hmm. said to Kevin, "This, these are the playoffs. Tell them to stop being funny. So that's what that was uh, uh, something that we we got a chuckle out of as well. So, so also let's put this in perspective, right? So NBC back in the day, right? And we're talking about, you know, three major networks. Fox was just, just starting to become ascendant in the late eighties, but NBC at that time was arguably the sports network juggernaut, right? I mean, yeah, ABC had money in football and CBS certainly had events and stuff too. And, and, and a heritage, but I mean, you know, NBA, NFL, you had horse racing, right? Um, and then by 1992, um, a, 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 and under uh, a, a unprecedented circumstances, uh, Messrs. Ebersol and friends uh, swooping in and, uh, and and starting at what has now become a very long and 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 productive relationship with the Olympic Games. Um, I I can't imagine you not feeling. Uh, fortunate to be in that environment because you could there are, there are a myriad of other broadcasting environments you could have been in versus that very hot juggernaut that was NBC Sports at the time. Again, great to be in the right place at the right time. And actually, the first Olympics NBC did was was before Ebersol got there, uh, the 1988 uh, Summer Games in Seoul. Sure. And and I was, you know, hoping to be a part of it and, and was going to be a part of it as, as NBC planned and their announcer lineup. And Michael Weissman said to me, hey, I want you to do a, a equestrian events. And I said, fine, I'm just happy to be a part of the Olympics. Uh, I said, now you do know that I do horse racing, but, uh, you know, about the dressage and all the other stuff, I don't really know anything about it. But I'd be happy to do it. So fine. So then maybe a, a couple of months before the games in Seoul, he called me up and said, I've changed my mind. I want you to do basketball with Al McGuire. And um, so that was the pairing for the Seoul Olympics. I did men's basketball with Al McGuire and women's basketball with Nancy Lieberman. And um, it was uh, it was a, an adventure for sure to spend uh, all that time with uh, with Al McGuire. He was, uh, again. Another uh, legend. You, you, have, you, have a knack for, you have a knack for working with legends, Tom. Yes, I do. Um, yeah, so so it was, uh, I mean, such uh, an interesting time that we had together. Not only did we do the Olympics, we were in Seoul for a month, but uh, we did lots of games leading up there with the Olympic team and actually with some other college games just for us to get used to each other's ways. And, uh, I mean, we got used to each other's ways for sure, and Al McGuire's ways are a little bit different. We always ate dinner in the uh, airport cafeteria because he said he put – hot sauce on anything, it'll be good enough to eat. And this will be a lot cheaper, you know, this way. And uh, he was so frugal. We uh, we got on the airplane to leave for a month in Seoul, and he had uh, his luggage was his, was, you know, you buy, a, you buy a suit, you get a little bag, the suit comes in with a hanger sticking out of the top. He had a couple of uh, hangers holding on, on his hands over his shoulders. He got on, and that was it, because he knew when he got to Seoul that everybody would be giving him all kinds of free stuff. So... He was uh, he was quite the partner, and uh, so many funny stories. I, don't, I can't tell too many of them, Tim, because some of them I don't know if they go to a, a general audience. But uh, some, some funny things happening with with Al McGuire, and and uh, you know, I, I, as you say, a legend, and I appreciated it. And uh, for for months after we got back, until his death, actually, uh, occasionally I would come home, and on the answering machine would be a message, and he'd say, uh, I, I'd pick up and be out and he would say tommy baby just wanted to tell you i love you and he'd hang up so it was a great time and again uh, i've been so lucky to work with two basketball legends al mcguire and bill walton and uh, have taken away so many good moments and memories from from those well, associations and, and that versatility right so so you know uh, uh, unspoken right is this uh, uh your uh your uh, performance in multiple sports right whether you were familiar with them or not right that's obviously uh making you uh, an all-around go-to for whatever NBC might be uh, getting rights-wise, like, for example, Notre Dame football in 1991, uh, which was a huge and unprecedented kind of deal, plus the the multiple NBC uh, Olympics packages, uh, which was itself also a brilliant 
master stroke of, of preventing other broadcasters from getting uh, games in the future, right? So um, again, yeah. what a stable uh, that uh, that you were in the mix for. T tell me how your Notre Dame football stuff sort of occurs as well as um, your ascendance, shall we say, within the Olympic universe, because some of the events that you're broadcasting, right, essentially become the marquee events for both winter and and summer. And that doesn't happen by accident. Well, I remember I had done a, an NBC, an NBA playoff game in Boston, the Celtics and the Pacers on Sunday and flew home after the game. And on Monday morning, I get a call from Dick Ebersole. And he says, uh, good job on the game yesterday. What do you know about track and field? I said, well, I've been to a couple of track meets in my life, but I really don't know much about it. He said, well, you'll be fine. I want you to do the uh, U.S. championships in two weeks, then to the world championships in Tokyo, and, and uh, after that, uh, providing all goes well, which I think it will, the uh, Olympics in Barcelona next year. And uh, so that was my introduction to track and field. Well, the, so hold on, hold on. I, I have to ask this question, right? Because I, I, television executives, right, especially somebody as as legendary as Dick Ebersol and and NBC Sports and all that stuff, and Don Allmeyer, sort of the part of that mix and stuff. How does that just happen, right? It was just like they come back from from like a cigar smoking, drinking uh, venture out, and all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, about that Hammond guy. I mean, how does that happen? Just like seemingly on a whim. Clearly, it wasn't. Yeah, I guess uh, Tim somehow or other, I had earned his confidence uh, over the years with the things that he had uh, given me to do, and uh, Charlie Jones had done the track and field at the Seoul Olympics and did not have a great uh, performance. So they were looking for a new track and field announcer. And I think Charlie was not happy with, with, with the result of all that. But um, somehow or other, I popped up in his mind when it came time to do it. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's racing. Maybe it's, it's that, that I knew about four-legged racing. Maybe the, the two-legged would be okay, too. But um, he, uh, he said, uh, yeah, you'll be fine. And he had to have confidence that I'd be fine. If he had known how it all unfolded, however, he might have had second thoughts. He wanted me to do those U.S. championships, and this was the height of uh, Leroy Burrell and Carl Lewis and their great rivalry in the 100 meters. Every time they ran, uh, there would be a new winner and a new world record, usually. And uh, so the the world cha the U.S. championships, excuse me, U.S. championships were on Randall's Island in New York. Oh, this, and, is, be this is before it got uh, uh, renovated. This is the old Downing Stadium, right? Yeah, exactly. And I'm... Uh, I'm there to to do the uh, the play by play, and we come on the air, and I say you know welcome, and we're looking forward to the rivalry between Carl Lewis and and uh, Leroy Burrell, and I turn to my analyst to, for a comment, ask him a question, and he can't talk. He I uh, 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 uh. so uh, then I put my arm around him and tried to prompt him to get him, and he still couldn't talk. He just could not. He was just completely frozen up, and then I'm thinking, uh, all right. Your first track meet, you got two hours to go, but we got through it. And uh, then at the World Championships in, in Tokyo, uh, when O.J. Simpson took over as the sprint uh, analyst, he had been on the USC 4x100 uh, NCAA champion. And uh, so, uh, and then on to, to the Barcelona Olympics. So that was my introduction into the track and field. And um in Barcelona, I not only did track and field, but I opened up before the track competition began. I opened up by doing a week's worth of diving, which I knew nothing about either. But I had to, fear is a great motivator. And when they say you're going to do diving or you're going to do track and field or whatever, uh, you better get to work and learn all you can about it and ask some stupid questions of the experts uh, so you don't make a fool of yourself when you go on the air. But there's also a certain tone, right? And 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 obviously dovetailing into figure skating as well on the winter side, right? I mean, there's a sort of a special, I don't know, a special skill, a special tone, right? Which is a bit more, um, I wouldn't say specific, right? But perhaps a little bit more broadly appealing, right? To the sort of casual fan, right? Certainly figure skating in particular and gymnastics, which you also participated in too on the, in the Olympics front. Um, those, uh, uh, there's obviously more women, uh, and or not necessarily hardy sports fans per se, or or more casual viewers because of the eventness, if you will, of the Olympics. Um, I got to think that Olmeyer and, and team were thinking, 
that your style and your vocal pattern and your sort of warmth, shall we say, um, is was certainly a differentiator, say, versus some other, you know, mechanically strong broadcasters in their own right for other sports for maybe more actively enthusiastic sports fans. Great, Jim, and uh, I didn't know this at the time. It turns out that figure skating is the most watched Olympic sport winter or summer. And uh, as you say, it does take a different approach. And I guess my minimal approach sort of um, uh, worked with that sport. And also, uh, I think that I know when to shut up and let the experts be experts and don't try to to uh, prove that I know something when I, when I actually don't. And uh, again, uh, I, I was to do my first uh, big broadcast at the World Championships in Munich. And uh, we had a meeting before the before the uh, event. And David Michaels, the younger brother of Al Michaels, was the producer. And we had a meeting with all the announcers and with uh, everybody on the production staff the day before the event. And when it's over, I let everybody sort of file out until I'm alone with David. And I said, David, I didn't understand a single thing that you guys were talking about. How am I going to do this? <laughs> and, of course, he says, ah, you, you'll be okay. And... and um, here I am thinking that figure skating is all flowers and feathers and fluff. And uh, so uh, Sandra Bezik, who was one of my co-commentators, uh, a former Canadian skater and uh, choreographer, said, come on, we're going with me and we're going to practice. And uh, we're sitting there in the front row of practice and Kurt Browning was the reigning world champion from Canada. And right in front of us, he did a jump and he went, boom. And the sound of that jump resonated with me. I said, oh, my goodness, this maybe I'll not be fluff and feathers after all. That that took some strength and some athletic ability. So that, that was the beginning of me coming to appreciate uh, figure skating and the, uh, the skaters and, and uh, what it takes to be a successful skater. And not only that, but when all my uh, male friends were laughing at me for doing figure skating, I said, let me just tell you. In my opinion, there's nothing more pressure-packed in all the world of sports than the ladies' long skate at the Olympics. You've worked your whole life for this moment, and you're probably not going to get another chance. This is probably going to be it. You've worked your whole life for this moment. You're out there on the ice by yourself for three and a half minutes. Knowing if you make the slightest bobble, uh, your life's work is over. And uh, there's nobody to get the rebound if you miss uh, there's no chance to, to make the putt at the Masters next year and on and on. Uh, it's pressure. And you could see over the years, I could see that the pressure affects some of those skaters. And it just the, the best skaters somehow would succumb to that pressure and, and not skate their best. So I came to appreciate what it took to be a, a figure skater and and uh, and really uh, some of the some of the best moments uh, in my Olympic uh, tenure were were on on the ice. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of of how your broadcasts are put together for those uh, for those olympic events because uh back in the day right that especially then this was um these marquee events were often tape delayed and reserved and saved for prime time so there was a lot of uh shall we say editing and and uh of pieces right so i how much of that are you aware of or are you in the moment as the live stuff is occurring and you're leaving it to the producers and, and others to kind of put those pieces together. Or do you have the opportunity to come back to kind of set things up and or maybe even edit on the fly, maybe in real time when it's being presented in prime time? I got, I'm just curious as to how that how that process works, because I think it's it's quite mystifying how that how that occurs, at least to the to the normal viewer. Well, Tim, I'm sure if I'd have made an egregious mistake that uh, somehow they would have found a way to fix it. But um and all the tape delayed Olympics I did, it was always live to tape. We never went back and made a correction. Interesting. And, uh, I say that the uh, the Olympic hundred meter dash, the men's Olympic hundred meter dash, is the toughest thing and that I've ever broadcast. Um, it's over in nine seconds. There's no margin for error. If you have to think about what you're going to say, it's too late. Race is over. Uh, there's no time to to look down at what lane they might be in. There's no time really to react to to how they look. You might have four runners in there all wearing the same country's uniform, looking kind of the same. And uh, so there's just no margin for error. It's the toughest thing. And 
I'm still knocking on wood right here as I speak to you that uh, I never miscalled one at the Olympics in Paris this year. There was such a, an event. So luckily, I never miscalled one for sports. But in the ones that I did, tape delay, there was always live to tape. And, and, and I believed that there was no chance to go back and make your correction anyway. Now, it, like I say, it might have been possible had it been something awful. But um, we did it with the idea that it's we're live, live, live. That's interesting. And, and you had some humdingers, too. I mean, Michael Johnson and Usain Bolt and, and, and Allison Felix. I mean, you you had a whole – there's some very memorable calls there, right? You're almost synonymous with with uh, a number of those, uh, not only other sports, but certainly track and field in those Olympics. Uh, any ones that strike you as being, uh, I don't know, leaving the, the biggest impression or, or that you remember the most uh, in that moment of calling? Man, there are so many, yeah. Uh... So many, Tim. Uh, Usain Bolt, of course, was he had been beaten by Tyson Gay at the Osaka World Championships uh, the year before the Beijing Olympics. So no one was expecting him to be what he had done. And if you'll remember, he, he won the 100 meters in world record time, not only set a new record, but smashed the old one and did it by clowning around the last few meters of the race. No telling how fast he could have gone. And a fair start, Asafa Pound. Usain Bolt is also out well. Here they come down the track. Usain Bolt sprinting ahead, winning by daylight. And setting a world record, 9.68. The wind is okay. New world record. How easy was that? And uh, we went back and looked at the tape, and one of his shoes was untied as well as he was flopping around as he, as he ran. So that, it was just uh, amazing to see what he had, he had done. And uh, he wound up running nine Olympic races in his career. He won all nine. I called all nine. And uh, so he was one of the most memorable athletes I've ever been associated with. You mentioned Michael Johnson, the first man to, to win the 400 meters and the 200 meters uh, in the same Olympics. He did it in Atlanta. If you remember the scene uh, in the 200 meters, he had the gold shoes on, which were flashing as he ran in the turn in the 200 meters. And back in the day when everyone had different cameras they had flash bulbs following around that was before your your phone had a camera i guess and and it was such an exciting event that i said that you know michael johnson to the finish and into olympic history and i noticed that i uh, had begun the race sitting and now was standing as the race was over uh it was it was so exciting flash bulbs flashing auto bold in the way well so is frank fredericks and here comes michael johnson they're approaching the top of the straightaway. Michael Johnson reaching deep. He has the lead. But Fredericks is still there. And so is Otto Bolden. But Michael Johnson has dead aim on the finish. Michael Johnson running for the road. And into Olympic history. A new world of that very set a world record. He destroys his old record. One of the most uh, poignant moments at the end of it, I said this is the Olympic spirit, was Derek Redmond, the British 400-meter runner. And this was in Barcelona. At the uh, in the semifinals of the 400 meters, as the race unfolds down the back stretch, and uh, he falls to the to the ground, so he's there laying on the track. The race finishes. I call the race, and uh, I happen to look up, and, and now Redmond is struggling to his feet and holding the back of his leg and staying in his lane. He begins to hobble along and around the turn for home. As he as he comes into that turn. This man runs out of the stands. Security tries to stop him. He will not be stopped. He couldn't be stopped. He runs out onto the track. Turns out, we didn't know this at the time, but turns out it was his father. And his father takes one of his arms, puts it over his shoulder, and together they hobble to that the finish line that he wanted so desperately to, to reach. And uh, as I said, that was the that's the Olympic spirit. And uh, that was just one of the moments that, that people really remember to this day. Tom Hammond and Craig Mass back, back at... Olympic Stadium in Barcelona coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Here are the lane assignments. Steve Lewis in lane three. Top four to Wednesday's final. Steve Lewis in lane three. Roberto Hernandez out quickly in four. Now down the back stretch. Ismael on the left of the screen is running very, very quickly. And inside of Lewis, Sunday Bada of Nigeria. And Derek Redmond of Great Britain has pulled up with an injury. Redmond is out. 
Derek Redmond, the British record holder and an important member of that British 4x400 four meter relay team as he doesn't want anybody to help him. It'll be Lewis to win in 44.50. Look at this. He's going to try to finish his semifinal race. The British have a certain tradition of running, which you have to respect. A bizarre finish to this first semifinal in the men's 400 meters. Derek Redmond of Great Britain pulled up with an injury halfway down the back stretch. He's fighting off those trying to help him to finish the race in his lane. And now the pain too much. swelling throughout Olympic Stadium as Redmond with assistance this time approaches the finish line he had wanted so desperately to reach. That is the Olympic spirit. I'll tell you one more story. Kathy Freeman was the aboriginal Australian 400 meter runner. When the uh, 400 meters was first run in the Olympics in 1960, an Australian woman won it. So they had a history in this event. In Atlanta, 1996, Kathy Freeman runs second in the 400 meters. And now the world knows that in four years, it's going to be in her home country in Australia. No Aboriginal person has ever won an Olympic gold medal. So she has all this pressure now building on her to perform in her home country in 2000. As we get to the games, uh, the pressure just mounts. Not only is everyone thinking and talking about it, but she's given the great honor, the distinct honor of lighting the Olympic flame at the opening ceremonies. So now as they line up for the for the race, I remember I said uh, Kathy Freeman has waited four years for this moment. Australians have waited since 1960, and her Aboriginal people have waited forever. And as they came to the top of the home straightaway, uh, it's not going to have a happy ending. It doesn't look like she's going to be able to win. And somehow she's able to will herself to victory. And a couple of steps past the finish line, she was wearing a unitar. She unzips it off her head, and you can see the look on her face is just one of disbelief. And uh, then after a couple of steps, she just collapsed to the track uh, with the weight of the exertion of the race and the weight of the world of pressure that she's been feeling all these four years lifted from her shoulders. As uh, as 110,000 in Olympic Stadium in Sydney uh, roar their approval, so that was one of the greatest moments ever. Kathy has waited for this moment since '96. Australia has waited since '64. Their Aboriginal people have waited forever. Says. And they're underway to a giant roar and the flash bulbs flash. And Kathy Freeman is out. Kathy Freeman is in lane six. And she's off to a good start in this 400 meter final. She's running very smoothly down the back stretch. Kathy Freeman has a very fluid style and she knows what she has to do. She's run from almost every single lane on the track and the pressure is on her. But Lorraine Graham is moving into position. Lorraine Graham in the black is making up the stagger, but Freeman kicks it up a notch. They're coming to the final turn and approaching the home straightaway. And it is Kathy Freeman is there. Kathy Freeman with Lorraine Graham. Catherine Mary has also come on from Great Britain. And Kathy Freeman has work to do, but she's up to the challenge. And Kathy Freeman goes to the lead. Here they come to the line. Kathy Freeman by a big margin for Australia. Is it fair to say that the Olympics is is the pinnacle, is the ultimate? I mean, I, it just it just seems to me that there's because of its scarcity 
and uh, national overlays and um, and just the the sheer uh, just scope and 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 wide swath of various sports and 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 all that sort of spirit that comes along with it. It just seems like it, there's no even even soccer's World Cup. I don't think even approximates it. I got to think that that gives you assuming that I got to think that gives you some extra special incentive to quote unquote get it right. Yeah, you assume correctly because to me the the Olympics is the pinnacle. It's it's the one thing that the whole world watches. Um, that the the whole world stops and takes a look at, at at what's happening. And you know while the Olympics is beset by you know divisions and politics and everything else, uh, it is still the one event that the world sort of finds a way to peacefully compete. Uh, and and uh, despite all its problems, it's still that to me. It's the um, it's the pinnacle of what I was able to broadcast all those years, and there, you know, each each thing I broadcast Tim, had had a special moment that I'll always remember. But the most of them come from the Olympics because of the importance of them, and and the fact that the the whole world is coming together there to decide uh, the fastest man in the world, for instance, or, or other things like that. So yeah, it's it, it's the best. All right. Well, let me shift gears then, because I, to go from that pinnacle, right. The wheels start coming off of NBC Sports a bit, some of it economically done, some of it managerial, right? And some of these marquee properties, right? The NBA uh, is done in what, I think 2002, the NFL, probably the one of the biggest blows, uh, that relationship almost 60 years uh, ends, well, it's announced, I think in 90, 1997, officially in 1998, until it's returned later in, in the aughts. Um, I mean, thank God for the Olympics, right? That's something that NBC is uh, uh, clearly affixed to. But I don't know. Going into the 2000s, it seems like there there's not much that's going to be left in the cupboard. Um, I know maybe there's still the horse racing stuff, but how do you feel about those properties leaving? And and do you worry that maybe I don't know that that, that NBC may not be the place to be going ahead, or or are you just kind of just keeping your nose to the grindstone? Well, we still have the Olympics, as you mentioned, and, and what was important to me, yes, yes, I missed the NBA going, and especially missed the, the NFL going. Uh, luckily, I'd been uh, tabbed, as you mentioned earlier, to do Notre Dame football, so I did get a, a football fix in there. Uh, Ken Shanzer, the president of NBC Sports, had uh, had the idea all along. He told me of uh, Chris Collinsworth and Tom Hammond doing Notre Dame football when he acquired the property, and so I was lucky to start doing uh, the Notre Dame games uh, as well. So I did have some football to do, but it was a blow when we lost those those marquee events. The thing that made me stick with NBC was the uh, you know horse racing. We had the Breeders' Cup all along, and then um, in some part, I guess due to my constant lobbying, driving everybody crazy, we did acquire the rights to the to the Triple Crown, the Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. And uh, so doing doing the horse racing was the uh, the thing that really that really kept me uh, at NBC, not trying to find a, a spot at one of the other networks. And, you know, at, at that point, I uh, I had risen to uh, be the number one, I guess, sports announcer at the network. And the, the one thing I regret is that I never got a chance to do a Super Bowl, which I you know, might have been able to do and, and when we reacquired the rights. But that's when the, the aforementioned arena football came into play, too. Uh, arena football was... Pat Hayden was at the time uh, my Notre Dame color commentator, and uh, they asked us if we would take on uh, arena football, which the NBC had acquired, thinking that uh, that will be something that, that tied the football fans over in the springtime. Uh, it didn't turn out that way ultimately, but it, the, the, but we said, all right, well, yes, we'll do it. Uh, they did ask me if I would do it, and I, and I said I would. Uh, and so... As it turns out, uh, we had a ball during the, the games. Uh, I don't know how many people watched uh, or how many people cared, but the games were so much fun. The uh, the players and coaches were so appreciative of us being there, so cooperative, and uh, it, w- it was just a lot of fun when we did those games for a couple of years. Yeah, I remember there's a New York Times article just before that first season, I think in 2003, was it, um, that really kind of just talked about, I don't know who all the, the names of the folks involved and stuff, but it was, I think it was just a prelude of like, hey, this is, we've been experimenting. Uh, this is a, maybe a week before the season began and there's doing all, doing all kinds of, there was a real enthusiasm 
for experimentally uh, playing around, so to speak, with what could be done with this relatively newfangled uh, property. But I, I think to your point, right, it's 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 hardly a, a gap filler for for losing the AFC conference of the NFL. But um, uh, did it take much to adjust to that? I mean, did, did, were there times where you kind of go, well, you know, it's just I think people kind of can raise their eyebrows a bit about in terms of how much football this really is. Um, what was your what was your thoughts as you were calling all those games stuff? Because the, the network really went all out. I mean, Al Trowick in the studio, you had regional broadcasts. I mean, you guys really went all out to broadcast this stuff. How yeah, they did. And that, I think that's one of the reasons that the league and its members were excited about having a, a real network come in and do a first class broadcast. And you're right, we didn't uh, hold back anything. We did the broadcast as we would have done an, an NFL broadcast. And uh, there was a bit of a learning curve because it was different. I don't know how many times uh, Pat Hayden used the phrase counterintuitive or used the word counterintuitive, but he did a lot because some of the stuff was counterintuitive. But I can just, uh, you know, just behind the back passes completed for a first down and, you know, letting the other team score so you can get the ball back because you're going to score so quickly at the end of a game. And just different things like that that you you had to become accustomed to. But as I said, it was uh, it, it wasn't the end of the world. There was no pressure to, you know, to get it just right because it's the playoffs and this has to be done perfectly and everything else. It was uh, let's have some fun. And indeed, we did have fun doing it. Would you, and we'll around the corner here, you've been gracious with your time. Can I, is fun an operative word for just the, the, the entirety of the, of the career at NBC? Cause it, I mean, it really does come through in our conversation and certainly on the air too, from, from my memories of, of your, your, your varied and, uh, and, and uh, calls and, and, and great moments. It didn't look like you were stressed by any means. It did look like you had some element of fun in there. I can't imagine under the surface it was always fun, but but how how much fun is it versus the workload and all that kind of stuff? I mean, people don't see the work right behind the scenes. Yes, and again, fear is a great motivator. So if you don't do the work, you're going to be in trouble. And that that was my philosophy always. And uh, you know, I often talk to him that uh, if I'm watching something on television and it appears that the announcers aren't enjoying it, aren't having fun, then how can I have fun watching it? And so. I always hoped that uh, I would enjoy it, and if I did, that it would come across to the viewer. And, you know, I always, this is sort of, uh, I don't know, this is sort of maybe an outdated philosophy, but I always thought of myself more as a reporter than a personality. Um, when I tune in to watch a game, I don't really tune in. And I always thought that, you know, remember that, that they're tuning in not to hear you, but they're tuning in to watch this event. Now, if I can with my commentary and enhance their enjoyment. That's what I'm there for, but they didn't tune in to hear me. So that's the way I always, uh, you know, uh, approached it. And as I said to you earlier, uh, sort of a minim minimalist, at least at times. And I was famous at NBC for the hand when I would stick the hand out in front of the color commentators face, uh, which was don't say anything. Uh, this is a, this is a moment that uh, we can only detract from. Anything we say is going to detract from these pictures that are telling the story. And uh, a perfect example would be uh, when American Pharaoh broke the 37-year drought of winning the horse racing's Triple Crown. And uh, as, it be as it became obvious that he was going to win, the 90,000 at Belmont Park went crazy, throwing things in the air, standing on tables and chairs, and everyone uh, videotaping with their, with their camera. And uh, it, it was just panicking. Pneumonium. And uh, when Larry Colmus, who called the race, said uh, the 37 year old drought is over, American Farrell has won the Triple Crown, I just put my hands up to uh, Randy Moss and Jerry Bailey, the co commentators, to no, don't say anything. We're going to just let this play. And our director, Drew Essikoff, one of the best sports directors in the business, got uh, some unbelievable pictures of, of that, how it all unfolded. And there was nothing we could say. And uh, that was sort of typical for. Uh, for any sport, for football, basketball, when there was a dramatic moment, I always thought that uh, less was more. Let's don't say anything here because we can only detract from what is an amazing, dramatic moment. Yeah, I think the art of laying out is is very difficult for this generation of broadcasters, especially given all the distractions and and uh, choice that's out there and 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 
uh, keeping attention in a, in a short attention span environment that we are in today's media. I, I wouldn't even call it a throwback. I think it's just it's a it's a classic and an essential skill that um, I think is lost on 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 a generation of of broadcasters. Uh, I, I fear that we may lose some of that um, restraint uh, as as part of the art of broadcasting. But I don't know. Maybe you see and hear other uh, green shoots, so to speak. No, not really. You hear lots of screamers these days. And, um, you know, at, at, at one of the races at the Olympics, I mean, the, the 10,000 meters, and they're screaming about an epic race, and so-and-so is doing this and that and the other, and I'm thinking, uh, you've got 28 laps to go. What What's going to happen if there really is a dramatic moment at the end of it? You've got no place to go. Um, but um, so... And I understand a bit that now, now since you have you know a hundred choices of, of tune in, maybe you feel like as an announcer you need to distinguish yourself to make yourself uh, stand out from the others. There's so many choices, but uh, I, I hope we're wrong. But I think that you're correct in saying that uh, it's a lost start. The layout is a it's going to be a thing of the past, I believe, and that and that's a shame. Uh, do you miss it uh, being in the booth? And frankly, can you? And maybe your wife is a better person to ask this question over your family. Can you actually watch a sporting event and and in in comfort and enjoyment, or is it a chore for you, or do you avoid it because you were in the business for so long and you know what's going on behind the scenes? Sports fans, so I enjoy watching, but sometimes you're right. I can't help but say, uh, "What would I have done? How would I have said that? Uh, how would I have done it?" And Sometimes the second guessing gets a little old, and sometimes I'm able to turn it off and just enjoy the event. But uh, you know, it was a great run that I had, and uh, I can't, I can't uh, regret any of it. Um, it was, it was, uh, again, so unlikely to start with. I never had a chance. I never had a thought of being an announcer. And to have all those years uh, at some of the biggest events in the world was uh, was a blessing, and and uh, one that I never could have foreseen. And uh, which makes it all the sweeter, I guess. Well, I know our audience is going to just absolutely uh, be enthralled with this conversation because not because of me, for sure, uh, because of the many memories uh, and, and uh, uh, legendary calls and just simply just the sheer versatility uh, of the dulcet tones of of one Tom Hammond. Um, what are you doing to promote the book? Um, what can we do to help that further besides obviously promoting the heck out of things? Um, are you going to do any personal appearances and stuff? And I guess embedded in that question is, um, can we figure out a way to get you back at least as a as a throwback to to the NBA on NBC kind of thing when uh, when that comes back? Because I think it's only I think it's only appropriate, especially given the stable of folks, including yourself, that were so legendary in those in those great years. Well, thanks, Tim. I'll, I'll lobby for that. We'll see what happens. Okay, um, but we'll try to help you as much as possible. But yeah, the book. Uh... Races, Games, and Olympic Dreams, A Sportscaster's Life, written with uh, Mark Story, a sports writer for the Lexington Herald Leader. And uh, we've been doing some signings and appearances off and on all throughout the mostly the state of Kentucky and Ohio. And uh, so those will continue, I guess, for a while. And, you know, I just kind of look ahead and see what I have to do the next couple of days because there have been a lot of them. But uh, they're all enjoyable, at least they have been so far. And uh, people have been nice. And, and I always say that... Um, the greatest compliment or the most satisfaction I got from all these wonderful things I was able to be a part of, uh, the greatest satisfaction was a total stranger would come up to me and say, you made us proud. And uh, that was that's that's what you're in it for, things like that, and, and for the enjoyment of being part of these great sporting events. Yeah, I, I wonder, and I, I'm not a broadcaster by trade, but I had a little, little bit of experience in broadcast news and stuff before I went into the media uh, uh, executive industry thing, advertising and marketing and stuff. Um, I, I just, I, I wonder how much you recognize uh, how much effect you do have and did have uh, and still do resonating with uh, with people who watch these broadcasts, right? Because I, 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 you know, clearly, you know, you're in a stadium, there's thousands of people, you know, you maybe get some feedback from, but, but, you know, you, you, there's a, there's a, an order of magnitude or, or two, right. Of the people that you are, if you will, touching or affecting, um, which is just, you know, legions of people, right? So I, there is plenty, there are plenty of sports fans out there that, that, that know that name and will recognize this voice 
immediately upon hearing the first, you know, uh, 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 you know, timber of your voice, right? Um, did you, I guess the last question in there is, did you ever recognize just how gigantic and how impactful um, your, your voice and your calling of these matches and these games for all this period of time ever was? I mean, is it, people are still probably resonating and, and, and remembering and recalling uh, in your presence, no? Yes, it always kind of surprises me too. Um, Tim, one of the things that I've, I'm proud of is the fact that I, I think I'm pretty much the same guy that has always been uh, a Lexingtonian, Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, um, I'm pretty much, I hope, the same as I was back at Lafayette. I've had classmates say that to me, that you haven't changed, and they appreciate that. And I hope that's the case because uh, I, I'm always a bit surprised at, at when people uh, make a big deal out of it because I feel like I was the lucky one to be able to be a part of those things. And again, if I was able to help everyone enjoy those events, then that was my job and uh, I'm happy to do it. I had a, a wonderful run. I, I had success that I never would have dreamed of any time in my life. And uh, and for it all to have uh, such a great, happy ending is uh, is wonderful. All right. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. I hope you did, too, in some of those clips as well. And uh, we thank Tom for uh, making time. And um, of course, you must get the book. It is published by the uh, University Press of Kentucky. It is called Races, Games and Olympic Dreams, a Sportscaster's Life. Uh, It is written in partnership with Mark Story, and it is forwarded by and you know it's going to be good because it's forwarded by this guy, Bob Costas. Uh, and uh, as they say, it is available wherever good books are found. You'll find uh, lots of great little anecdotes in here uh, beyond some of the things that uh, we've talked about here today. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, search up this episode number 365 with Tom. Uh, you will find a convenient link or two or three uh, to the various versions that you can get via Amazon. And uh, as we uh, love to uh, remind you, uh, we get a couple of shekels of referral love. Uh, when you do so. So we appreciate that very much indeed. Uh, Let's see, while you're online, why don't you follow us on our socials uh, on the uh, X Twitter thing. You'll find us at Good Seats Still, and you'll find us uh, just about everywhere else, including the Threads thing, at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, Instagram will uh, do you there, and uh, Facebook, that's also our handle there. Uh, Our YouTube handle is the same. Again, Good Seats Still Available, at little at good seats still available there you go uh if you'd like to send us some email you can do that too we're at hello at good seats still available.com and uh while you're on our website once you're tooling around there make sure you check out our uh, merch site check out our fine vendors of stuff great uh, forgotten uh, uh garb and uh related materials from teams and leagues and situations uh that are no longer with us so we appreciate when you make a purchase there too more shekels come our way to keep our lights on and we appreciate that as well thank you so much for listening i hope you enjoyed it and uh lots more to come as we uh, turn into fall and into the uh, winter months so many great conversations and people uh, coming your way hope you enjoy it please tell your friends give us some five-star reviews wherever you rate and review and uh we appreciate it to no end thanks a lot we'll see you next week (laughs) 